Hello, I'm Bob Denton, and welcome to another conversation. You know, for more than a decade, there's been increasing concerns about the state of higher education in America in terms of access, cost, curriculum, and campus culture. But joining me in a conversation on the state of higher education in America is Dr. Peter Wood. He's president of the National Association of Scholars. Dr. Wood is an anthropologist and former tenured faculty member, administrator, and provost. He's also the author of several books, scholarly articles, and several hundred articles in print and online journals. Dr. Wood became president of the National Association of Scholars in 2009. And so, Dr. Woods, thank you so much for joining us today. Delighted to be here. Well, I probably should uh, start with uh, uh, making a couple of uh, uh, confessions of sort, or at least uh, disclosures. Uh, yes, I have uh, over 40 years in higher ed myself, for those in the audience who may not recall that. Uh, 32 of those years was as an administrator. Um, and so I have certainly been in the role as a tenured faculty member, uh, name chair and uh, directorships and what have you. And there's been a tremendous amount of change. And the second thing I will say before we get started is that I've proudly been a member of the National Association of Scholars since I think it was, I think it was 93 to the mid 90s. And I certainly have had that as a, as a proud association uh, on my, what they call curriculum vita. So I wanted to disclose that. Um, but as before we kind of look at some of the areas and perhaps concerns and some of the drastic changes in higher ed, let me first ask you if you would kind of give that elevator speech of what is a National Association of Scholars and its mission? Well, we're a membership organization of about 4,000 scholars. Um, our mission is to promote and defend the liberal arts, the liberal arts tradition in higher education, which means the pursuit of truth, the, the idea that uh, intellectual freedom matters deeply to the pursuit of truth, and that the purpose of American higher education is in part to cultivate virtuous citizenship among its graduates. And um, from a 40,000 foot view, that same elevator speech, and we'll, we'll cover some of the various elements, but how would you characterize if someone visited and said, what is the state of higher education in America today? How would you initially respond to that? Well, I would say it's lamentable. We're in an era of uh, academic decadence mm -hmm. in which uh, some of the core principles of higher education have been misplaced. Sometimes they're now treated with actual hostility that uh, what we have seen is the politicization of almost the entire curriculum. Uh, along with that has come an extraordinary run up in the price of higher education, the tuitions and other fees that students pay and a diminution of the quality of education so that the degrees that uh, students gain not only fail to ground them into this broader tradition of intellectual freedom, but in many cases fail to prepare them for the marketplace and for the careers that they hope to have subsequent to their graduation. Uh, all around, we're in a picture of decline. Uh, higher education's total numbers in the United States uh, 10 years ago were several million more than they are now. And in the world of higher education, virtually everybody believes that that decline is only beginning, that we're going to see a, a, a reading out of, oh, perhaps uh, as much as a third of the institutions that exist today before the next decade is over. Well, you know, um, again, um, that is at the 40,000 foot level. Do we see distinctions between, for example, public or private institutions or geographic locations of institutions? Or is it really something that we can say about higher ed uh, across the board? Well, I think a lot of what I just said applies across the board, but distinctions are certainly available. The distinction between public and private is not as robust as it once was. We have state universities, major state universities in all 50 states, and a galaxy of smaller campuses usually associated with those. But the so-called private institutions also gain much of their income through public sources, through Title IV student loans, and we're just learning from yesterday that uh, the forgiveness of those loans is going to treat the so-called private institutions 
just the same as the public ones. Mm -hmm. So public money is at the root of much of what goes on in American higher education. And it's oftentimes uh, the pursuit of that public money that is one of the great distortions of the real purpose of higher education. Well, you know, it comes as no surprise, poll after poll shows that Americans are losing confidence, adult Americans, of all of our major institutions. Uh, in 2020, 70% of Americans said colleges have a positive effect on the country. This year is down to 55%. That's a tremendous drop in just a couple of years of, of faith in higher education. Now, there is a difference between Democrats and Republicans in those perceptions, liberals and conservatives. But certainly the lack of readiness, and we look at the workforce, seems to also be contributing to that. A lot of loss of confidence generally uh, nationwide. I think that loss of confidence is so steep in part because Americans are now tuning into what really goes on on college campuses. Students are coming out convinced that the country into which they were born or to which they immigrated uh, is rotten to the core. The, the basic message of much of American higher education now is that our nation is unworthy and that it needs to be radically transformed. The mission of the students is not to uh, recognize what's good in their country and build on it, but to tear the whole thing down. Um, that message does not sit well with the people who pay the bills. The parents, uh, thus the citizens of the United States look on higher education now as if not quite the enemy, at least an adversary of what's good in America. And um, we will hit some of the various areas a little bit in more detail. I will say that your website does an excellent job, uh, National Association of Scholars website, of uh, providing what you think is, as an association of the critical issues and trends. And I want to highlight just a couple of them. We talk about the, in terms of academic content, and I guess the politicization you've mentioned in the classroom is at an all-time high. But what is kind of interesting is the change or disappearance of a core curriculum. How is that significant from your perspective? Well, the idea of a core curriculum is that there are certain kinds of knowledge, certain facts that really belong in the minds of everybody and that when you get to college, you're probably going to end up specializing in something. But before you specialize, you should have a grounding in some basics. You need to know how to write well. You need to know something about the history of Western civilization, uh, understanding the basic structure of the American government and how we are a self-governed people uh, are things which really are so basic that they belong uh, in everybody's education. Now, at one time, we might have expected that that's the job that would have been accomplished in high school. Uh, that is not something we can count on anymore. We find that most students arriving at college are, if not dead ignorant of these broader traditions, they are uh, woefully underprepared for what's to come next. Now, the trouble, of course, is that uh, the these basics that really belong to everybody have been eroded away, in some cases just disappeared. It was uh, 14 years ago, we did a study of what had happened to the required Western civilization courses that used to be standard in American higher education. Uh, we went back through college catalogs all the way to 1962, at which point we found that almost every college required two semesters of Western civilization. By 1990, those numbers had thinned. There were only a handful of colleges that required it. Others still had it as an elective. By 2010, we found one college in the whole country that still had a robust commitment to teaching Western civilization. That was William and Mary. And uh, not soon after we published our report, William and Mary woke up and uh, realized it was out of step and abolished that requirement. Um, what has happened with Western civilization has happened in almost every other area as well. Students do need to learn how to write, but these days that's usually handled in something like a freshman seminar, which could be on a boutique topic of minor significance. But the idea that there are 
important books that everybody should read, perhaps Plato's Republic, for example, has just disappeared. Um, you may go to a college in which you can find Plato's Republic taught someplace in the philosophy department, but you will not find a college where everybody has to read that book or many other really important books that form the spine of Western civilization. You know, it seems, and I, I know I'll be criticized and it won't be the first time for saying such, but it does seem like in the disciplines of the humanities and social sciences that they teach everything from a certain worldview and perspective. No sense of objectivity from the standpoint of teaching, but it is almost from advocacy. So it's not only in terms of the core curriculum, but it seems to me that it's also in a matter of the presentation that's become so uniform, and especially the approaches in the humanities and social sciences. Well, there's, there's a long conversation to be had about that. <laughs> I realize we have only a few moments to talk. Yes. Uh, but what I would say is that uh, a kind of disdain for America and for the West has become a, a settled proposition. So if you're going to read works of literature, they're going to be works that are oriented towards depicting how oppressive that the West has been or how uh, much of a failure America has been, that its offers of, uh, of freedom and equality have proved to be bogus for too many people. That's the perspective that is uh, and kneeled to what goes on in the social sciences and humanities, increasingly it's finding its way into the natural sciences too. Mm. One wouldn't think that's an easy thing to accomplish, but it is happening. And it's happening in the form of finding your physics department or your biology department, making its uh, own commitments to diversity, equity, inclusion, changing the standards by which faculty members are hired, students are admitted, or students are even evaluated in, in their progress. So this, this uh, basic hostility to America has now become the, the baseline of much of American higher education. I, I do wanna put some breaks on these uh, broad statements I'm making. I, I know many, many faculty members who are themselves uh, in strong disagreement with this approach, but they are pretty much powerless to change what's happening. Uh, the bureaucrats that run higher education and they now outnumber the faculty members are insistent on their ways. And if we are to uh, see advancement for a career in higher education, the faculty member has to conform. If he or she doesn't, uh, the career is going to be cut short. You know, you're talking about cost and we know it's been trying to um, be addressed. We've had incredible um, tuition increases, but I have to tell you, and, and again, I've been, I was in administration 32 years of some sort. Um, the academic and administration bloat is just really something. Um, when I went and doubled the number of students, I only had two more faculty lines. I don't, it, it, all I saw with the hiring was over at the Dean's office and there in terms of the administrative uh, offices. And it's interesting in terms of that and some of those positions they call um, uh, AP faculty in terms of the professional faculty and they count that, but yet they're doing uh, staff and administrative things. Variable tuition might be something. I don't know why the university themselves shouldn't be held accountable for some of the excessive costs in terms of higher education. Well, um, I've been promoting the idea now for several years that uh, colleges and universities should be responsible for a portion of the debt that their graduates fail to pay back, uh, or if students drop out, uh, they should be held responsible for the money that the public has advanced to get those students where they are. Um, there is an element of fiscal responsibility that uh, colleges and universities seem somehow to have slipped out of without any uh, consequences. And I'm afraid we're seeing more of that now with this uh, debt forgiveness. You know, after all, where does that debt come from? It comes from money taken from the public to pay for all those administrators in, in higher education. And the administrators are now more than half of the uh, salaried employees of colleges and universities. So one good first step to reducing the costs would be to simply say, if you want to be uh, eligible for 
public funding, you have to cut your administrative staff by 50%. Overnight, we would see a dramatic decrease in the cost of higher ed. You know, another area of concern is the broad area of academic integrity. And it's astounding to see how many cases that the honor system now deals with. And over the last decade, such an increase in terms of honor violations. And sadly, even in my own former units, the dealing with uh, grade inflation. Uh, so the broad notion of academic integrity is an area that is a little bit alarming in terms of what we see happening across higher ed. Right, we, we have uh, cut academic standards for a variety of reasons, but one of them is that higher education now sees students as consumers. Uh, the idea of students being there because they don't know something and have to struggle, sometimes work very hard to acquire knowledge has been displaced by the notion that the university owes the students grades. Now, you and I have both been faculty members and have certainly heard the story that you get from students and sometimes even from their parents that we're paying the bills, we deserve A's. And <laughs> one can chuckle about it, but I, I've heard that enough times to realize that that's, that represents a change in what the university is. It's now a service provider in which a substandard service is indicated by someone not getting the grade that he wants. Uh, so what's happened to testing? What's happened when students are caught plagiarizing? Uh, there's a kind of readiness on, on the part of most of these institutions to smooth things over, to give the student the second, third, fourth, and fifth chance. Maybe there's no consequences at all to cheating on tests, failing to turn in papers, uh, simply treating higher education as a lark. Two of the areas of, of concern, I guess, and it's broadly defined as campus culture. But wow, you know, um, a lot of the uh, dorm base indoctrination, these learning communities perhaps have nice commonalities, but some of them are not about in terms of subject, but it's more about social kinds of, uh, of, of gatherings and the, the activism. Um, it's hard to, to really see and understand the, the, the different climate and attitude changes that pressure in terms of college campuses today. Well, yes, and that's another one of these complicated issues. Something that stands out for most people these days is the effect of social media. Uh, the students pay far more attention to each other than they do to their faculty. Maybe they always did, but there were limits on how much socializing you could do before uh, the iPhone came along to make it uh, such a, a pervasive community that you're always being watched, you're paying attention to what others say about you. That makes the, the turn to social activism a whole lot easier. People can be bullied into conforming to what amounts to a sort of mob mentality on campus. Uh, faculty members and administrators do precious little to, to stop that. Um, higher education since the 60s has also been um, uh, invaded by this sense of uh, sexual liberty, which has uh, its own dire effects on student lives. That is, students, instead of learning to be adults and being prepared for a world in which they're going to have to take adult responsibilities, are invited to a, a period of uh, social license in their lives uh, that intersects with the social media aspect of it. It creates on campus this, uh, this world which has very little to do with becoming a citizen of the United States who knows how to act appropriately in public and much more to do with uh, treating higher education as a vacation from uh, real life. And one of the big areas as we look at governance and, and what some administrations have done, of course, is we don't call them speech codes anymore, but we call them principles of this and that. And we want to all uh, get together and really impact the notion of freedom of speech. And we don't see quite as much as disinvitation because differing views don't get invited as they once did for all types of reasons, some being risk and otherwise. And so the whole notion of the freedom of speech, the clashing of ideas that will result in truth, 
that's a real battle area that I have seen grow, especially over the last decade. Yes, the new rhetoric treats uh, speech as a kind of violence or potentially violence. Uh, we've talked about hate speech these days as though hate speech was something prohibited by the First Amendment. There's a lot of confusion on the part of students when they encounter the reality that actually hate speech is not a prohibited category and it's simply a subjective judgment that students make about uh, views that they disagree with. The, uh, the notion here that one can have a community with a robust uh, regard for debate or for exchange of views or hearing opinions that cut across your own has pretty much declined into uh, a, a period of obsolescence. And I'm hoping we can revive that. Um, maybe this program will help in some small way. <laughs> well, and you certainly articulate um, some trends um, and I wonder if we look at, and you're looking in your crystal ball, what are several little trends that you're detecting that's going beyond currently and what you see in the next perhaps five to 10 years? Well, I think that high on my list of trends is the willingness of parents, families, students to avoid higher education. Part of the decline we mentioned earlier is that significant numbers of students are saying, I can do better going into a trade, going to a, a vocational program, uh, going into the military. This seems to be especially true among male students. We now have a very large disparity between boys and girls going to college. Um, so those trends I think are likely to continue the opting out from higher education of people who think it's no longer worth the candle uh, is going to continue. Um, we have just watched in, in this last week a blow up at the American Historical Association in which the, the president of it, Professor Sweet, had the uh, temerity to publish a statement in one of their journals that said, we're, we're doing too much distortion of the past through presentism, looking at everything that once happened as though it were happening today and judging it accordingly. Um, it was a, a pretty bland kind of view of what's going on from a significant historian. He got his head handed to him the very next day. There was an outpouring of outrage from members of the American Historical Association who said, well, basically, how dare you, Professor Sweet, uh, you are uh, validating people who say hateful things. And therefore, uh, we are damaged by your speech. Shut up. Well, Professor Sweet promptly apologized and took back what he had said. So uh, that's just one instance. And it is, however, indicative of this trend, which is our, our administrators, our elected officials and associations, the, the presidents of colleges and universities now tend to grovel. They do not stand up for principle. They have the power to do it. They refuse to use it. And if by the stake they get up on the wrong side of bed one day and say something true, they promptly retract it the next day. Well, we have only a, a couple of minutes or so remaining. Um, the ideals, um, as you look, some of the goals, what are some of the things that you might pick to highlight from the list that you provide on that site, such as intellectual standards, and individual merit? If, if you're looking at some goals, what should we be trying to look for in terms of the higher education experience? I think we should be looking to create good character in students. Good character would include courage, intellectual curiosity, a willingness to listen and listen carefully to what others have to say, a willingness to experience and express some doubts about one's own convictions because they should be subjected to careful analysis. We're not, um, calling for a National Association of Scholars censoring anybody's views, including views we disagree with, but we, we would like to see this to be a world in which uh, genuine curiosity leads students to rediscover just this wonderful tradition of intellectual and political freedom that has made our country great, that uh, is now at risk of being lost. Well, Dr. Wood, that's all the time we have. I'm so very grateful for you joining us.
And I also want to thank you, the audience, for joining us and hope you would do so again on the next conversation with Bob Denton.